next uh, session is about logic apps patterns and its best practices in this session uh, 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 it covers how to implement parallel executions uh, retries exception handling and advanced uh, message patterning thank you all so you guys know who i am now yes okay so we'll we'll first step through some workflow patterns and then go into some messaging patterns uh, some of the, the you know, capabilities that we have in logic apps are um, you know, a lot more powerful than you may, may think. Right? One of the things that we've tried to do in the designer is give you a really simple experience so that you can do rapid development on top of logic apps so you can get your scenarios done really quickly. Um, and so we give that, that you know, very, very intuitive and seeming you know, very simple type of designer experience you can go ahead and uh, get your, your your uh, business process done. Uh, but under the covers, we're actually doing a lot of work for you. And you know, as you lift the covers, there are a lot more capabilities that are actually uh, there for you to take advantage of. Uh, you know, especially as you get into more of your enterprise integration scenarios and you want to have better assurances that uh, your, your process will work or be able to uh, deal with, with bad situations. Because right? bad situations happen all the time. Uh, the first one is a retry policy. So we have every action has a default retry policy, uh, and it will retry uh, some exponential, exponential random amount of time up to, up to a minute um, uh, four times within that minute, right? So 10 seconds, 30 seconds, 20 seconds, and it'll retry to create some randomness in that, in that retry. You can turn it off. Um, turn it off is in, in scenarios where you don't want retries to happen and you want to fail fast and then handle that error yourself. Um, or you can do a custom retry policy, either a fixed, um, a fixed rate or an exp exponential rate so that you can go ahead and, and if you know that you, you have certain types of failures that may take a certain amount of time that you know take five minutes, then you know, retry after five minutes instead of you know, just a few seconds. Uh, so you know, in, my, in my previous talk, I, no I noted that you know, we have a uh, graph of uh, connectors, uh, of actions. And that graph is defined by that run after, run after property, right? It says run, this action will run after step B or A. So in that run after, there's uh, a few things that you can take advantage of, and I'll, and I'll show this uh, in the demo, where you can have conditional dependency control to say, hey, I want this to run after step A if it failed. So by default, we say run after A if it succeeded, and that's the, the magic you see in the background that we'll, we take care of for you. But you have the control to go ahead and manipulate those run afters so that you can get a, 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 an error handling experience, that you can say run after failure or some timeout or if that, lot, that step has been skipped. You can also add a limit uh, policy to your logic app, to your action. Uh, and that will limit the duration of that action. So if you want it to only run for 30 seconds, you can put a limit on it for 30 seconds and then check the status to see if it actually uh, hit that limit versus giving you the, um, the answer that you wanted. You don't want to block that long on a call. Uh, you can terminate your logic app. So anywhere within your logic app, you can decide that uh, you want to terminate. You know, uh, a typical pattern is that uh, you go ahead and catch an exception, then in that exception you terminate the action so that it doesn't do the rest of your, your workflow. Uh, when you terminate, you can, you can terminate with failed or success. For example, if you've handled the error, uh, you don't want your operators to think that something's failed because it's actually been handled, so you can terminate with success, or you want to end your process early. And finally, there are scopes. Scopes is your ability to uh, have a collection of actions that run and then have a single output status when it's complete. So meaning that uh, the scope will have the final status based on the leaf nodes of all the actions that happen within that scope. Right? So if a very simple scope just has you know, one or two actions in it, there's only one leaf node. But you can have sets of parallels in that as well. And we have to do um, essentially a join across all of those, those leaf nodes to determine what the status of that, of that scope is and it will be uh, essentially an or of, an and of all those, those statuses. So you can use all these things together to have, you know, for you guys who are, who are more dev focused, a try, catch, finally pattern, right? That try, catch, finally pattern can be accomplished uh, with logic apps with a set of scopes and then a set of, of uh, different run after policies. So you would put your, the actions that you want to execute in that try scope, right? There's a, a, a your scope, you just, I just happen to call it try. And then you have another scope that says, if the scope has failed, 
run, run the actions within this catch scope. And then you have a scope after that says, no matter what's happened, in any scenario, I always want you to execute the actions in this scope, and that gives you that finally step to make sure that it always runs no matter what's happened before it. Right? So that gives you that try, catch, finally pattern that you can actually build out in, in Logic App. So that, that allows you to do um, you know, compensation logic or send out uh, detailed error messages to logs or to uh, operators to go handle you know, a particular scenario or fix a message and, and you know, resend it or whatever that, that right model is for doing that. But we have that pattern. It's not very obvious. When you look at a designer, it's like, oh, it's so simple. How do I do you know, these advanced, advanced things? And we have that capability built in for you. So concurrency. So you know, I, I, I mentioned in my last talk how Logic Apps is a highly, highly parallelized set of actions that execute in the back end. And so uh, you know, realizing that there's a, a couple things you should uh, understand. So instances are created concurrently. So for example, if I have my Logic App with a request endpoint and I call that request endpoint and it's an async call, and I call, 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 if it's, you know, that Logic App takes a minute, I don't have to wait for that Logic App to finish, it will actually create three instances of that Logic App. Right, so, so instances run concurrently. Or if I pass it um, a collection and I do a split on, then that thing will actually create a number of instances in the background. Sometimes you don't want that to happen, uh, either because you, have, uh, you don't want to overwhelm a downstream system, right? because our logic app can run highly parallelized, but your downstream system may be a legacy system that can't handle the type of load. So then you can uh, control that. And, and in particular, if you have scenarios where you want to do in-order processing <coughs> of, of workloads, then you can use a singleton trigger execution. So you can set that level of parallelism to one. Um, or if you just want to control the, the amount of uh, parallel instances that are running, you can control that in the trigger as well with the degrees of parallel uh, value that you have up there. And I'll show you that in a demo. So then you also have parallel action. So um, in, in the Logic App, you can actually have uh, two actions or three or four or five run in parallel in your definition. You can set that up uh, uh, as well. And then it gets joined with the magic run after it says it will run after A, B, and C. That actually acts as a join in your logic app. Uh, for each loops are natively uh, concurrent. So we will take a collection that you, you pass to the for each loop and we will run uh, by default 20 instances at the same time. Um, so keep that in mind that it actually, and, and we'll have some scenarios of why you need to keep that in mind later with, with Derek's part of the talk. Uh, so there are scenarios where you want to, want to make that sequential. If you need to deal with those items in order, for example, you want to, want to have a sequential for each. Or you want to, for the same reason, not overwhelm a downstream system that's uh, being hit by that collection. You can control the degrees of parallelism uh, that's there for you. Or if you want to extend it as well, you want it faster. Do until loops run sequentially. Right, by, by the nature of its, of its intent, which is do something until some state is true. And if you do something in parallel, you don't know what state you're in. So uh, it's a, it's a um, sequential loop that will occur and iterate each time you know, across that, the collection of actions you have in that uh, do until loop. So uh, one of the capabilities that Logic Apps has and, and is sometimes in a, uh, underutilized or un, unrealized uh, value is that it has the ability to do scheduled execution. So these kind of background jobs that, you, that you'd like to run that do cleanups or uh, you, know, you want to um, you know, execute something that's on a schedule, you know, we have that in the schedule execution. So uh, you can have simple recurrence every few minutes, every few seconds, every five days. Uh, you can have recurrence with a deterministic time. So I don't want this job to run until 10 a.m. tomorrow. Right? You can have it run exactly at 10 a.m. tomorrow. Um, or you can have it run at every hour at midnight. You want to be you know, at clock time you know, with that. We can do complex schedules. So the first and last Sunday of every month at 5 p.m. You can do that as well. Uh, as well as run once jobs. So in other words, uh, I have a scheduled job that I want to run once. There are a lot of scenarios where, where 
where uh, ISVs can include this as the implementation detail for jobs that need to run, right? If I want to you know, have my device you know, uh, wake me up and my alarm can actually be a logic app that's running in the background. So instead of you having to build that infrastructure to understand, hey, I got a thousand devices and you know, all these schedules that need to run because my, my customers have set scheduled items, uh, start my car, set an alarm, you know, all that, you can actually use a logic app, which will then create uh, and manage that, that uh, schedule for you and then call you back or call whatever API that you want to execute that. So this is a good scenario for run once jobs. Uh, with run once jobs, this is a pattern that you can use. So you can have a request trigger that will act as your API to create a, uh, a time-based job. We will have a delay until in that logic app and then based on the input that you have for when you want that to fire, then we will sit there and wait for you. And you don't have to worry about, it's like, oh, if you were to do that on your own, you'd have all this infrastructure that's sitting there with open sockets and threads and you know, don't do that, right? Use logic apps. Um, so then you can have millions of these running, right? These are not definitions, these are not resources, right? These are instances of a logic app. So you can have lots and lots of these things running in the background and uh, you get a run ID or you can do an XMS client tracking ID, which is your own tracking ID to map to that, that item and then you can call it back and, and delete it if you, if you need to um, or see what the status of it is. Okay, messaging patterns, right? How many guys think of yourselves as enterprise integrators? Of course, that's why you're here, right? Yeah. So, you know, uh, uh, how many of you read Fowler's Enterprise Architecture book? And the rest of you are just ashamed that you didn't read it. Okay. No. Uh, so, you know, there, there's a lot of those patterns that are in that book that uh, even though that's, uh, you know, that book was written quite some time ago, those patterns are still, uh, valid and, and used a lot today. Um, so you know, as you think about the messaging protocols and these patterns, um, you know, you'll see these come to light you know, and, and the power that you have and the capabilities you have in logic apps to realize those, those patterns. So first I want to go through some messaging protocols that we have built in. Uh, so of course you can do REST and SOAP. You've been seeing that throughout the, the conference and we can do that with an HTTP action calling out to some uh, REST or SOAP endpoint. You can have it in connectors. Um, or you can have it in your custom connectors that are calling out to these REST or SOAP endpoints. And of course, you can have your own trigger in your logic app that acts as a receiver for a request, an HTTP request. Uh, we have workflow invocation. So you can componentize your logic apps and then call that workflow. And we'll handle the, the protocol in, under the covers for calling that workflow. Um, we also have a batch uh, action so that you can send messages to a batch and then have another logic app with a receive batch which can then handle the, the batches that are received, and I'll talk about that in a minute, too. Queuing, so we have storage queues, M queues, service bus queues, right, so great for, for uh, asynchronous one-way messaging. Pub sub with service bus topics, and MQ again, so that you can go ahead uh, and do pub sub across those entities. Uh, right, so now you're starting to see the patterns, right? Uh, is, how many people use BizTalk? Yes, that's why you're at the BizTalk conference. So you now if you're familiar with the message box, so a typical pattern is to use service bus with topics that would represent you know, something similar to the, what you have with the message box today so that you can create subscriptions to services uh, and then you know, instead of pipeline, pipelines, you'd have logic apps that would act as your, your pipeline and then they can all communicate across topics creating a uh, loosely coupled set of processes based on subscriptions. Right, great, way to, great way to implement that. Uh, event streams, event hubs, and IoT hubs. I started IoT hubs. That's one of the connectors that are coming really soon. Uh, so then you can ingest uh, these types of events. And then finally, eventing for event grid so that you can uh, get push, push notifications of interesting events that are happening either within Azure or your custom topics. So there are a couple different types of messaging communication patterns, right? These, you know, the, the blue items should be very familiar to you for you guys that are doing enterprise uh, messaging. Uh, direct synchronous messaging, so you can do a request reply. So that's blocking, for example, I can do an HTTP action that will actually wait for that uh, synchronous call to come back. Um, or you can do a call workflow and you can design your workflow either sync or async in this case, so that it will wait for that workflow to come back. Uh, direct asynchronous. 
so you can do a fire and forget. So then you, you call some HTTP endpoint, or you can be you can design your logic app to behave in this way, so that uh, it fires and then says, "Okay, I'll do the work. I promise." You go away, and you're happy. So 201. Um, you can do call workflow async. So you return a, the, the async patterns 202, where you return a retry after header and a, and a location header. So then uh, it indicates for the caller, um, "Hey, call this endpoint back uh, in this amount of time," and then we'll tell you when that that job's complete. And it works both. If you have a service that implements that async pattern and you use our HTTP action, we will actually do that follow for you. So you don't have to, to, to explicitly do that in your logic app. The HTTP action in the background will follow that 202 pattern. Uh, fire and wait and poll. Uh, so this is when you have um, uh, like a do until loop and you have a status that comes back and it's a 400, but you're looking for some content in that status to say that it's actually done. So sometimes you have um, uh, scenarios where it's uh, a 400, but some value happens means you know a lot of people doing their own weird scenarios for their APIs and status codes. So if it's not a typical pattern, you can still implement it in logic apps with a do until and uh, a HP action, and then have criteria based on that on the values that are returned. And then finally, webhook. So then you can uh, register a webhook, and we'll wait until they call <laughs> us back right in the middle of the workflow. Uh, and that's what's done with, for example, the uh, uh, send approval mail. We actually open a webhook and they call us back when it's done. Okay, so now getting on the async messaging side, you have uh, message correlation. Uh, so if you, if you want to uh, send a message and then wait for an asynchronous response to come back, um, there's a couple ways to do that. So we have uh, correlated messages so that you know, on, the, uh, on the reply message you get uh, Sorry, on the request message, you'll get a, re a reply queue that you want to be able to listen to. Um, that's response queues, or you can use session queues that you're listening to for that uh, correlation for the set of, of uh, facts that happen to be correlated, right, session queues. Uh, for ordered delivery, we have the singleton pattern so that as you're reading messages off a of queue, remember I said that we we're highly paralyzed, but you can actually change that so that it's running in order and only processing one message at a time. And finally, partitions. So you can have partitioned messaging. So partitioned messaging will allow you to have um, you know, all messages for you know, if, if patient's going into a hospital, I want all of Bob's messages as he, as he goes into the hospital to go into one session um, or be correlated in some way, then you can do that as well with partitioning, either through batch uh, session queues and topics or sequential convoys. For you all you biz talk guys out there, we do sequential convoys. Okay, um, so these one-way messages, we have the ability to do queues, competing consumer, pub sub, uh, and batch. Uh, I think I did this, but uh, it got repeated. So yes, that slide didn't get pulled out. Uh, so message, hand message handling pattern. So we have the, the splitter pattern. So as a message comes in, you have a split on property that's on your trigger, for example, and uh, it will actually look at the collection that gets passed in the message and create multiple instances of your logic app based on that, uh, that property path. So we'll, we will do that work for you. You can do your own split with the for each, and, and Derek will show you that a little bit later. Um, the claim check pattern, so you don't want to, in messaging scenarios, you don't want to pass big late payloads as part of your messages in your queue. So the pattern that you use is a claim check where your, where your queue message has a reference to your item, for example, in a blob store. So if you have a, you know, a 20 megabyte message, you don't pass that in the queue, you pass a reference to it. And then you go ahead and pass that around, and then we can pull it only when we need it uh, within the business process. Uh, data transformation and richer. So then you, know, you saw we have, from the talk yesterday, in enterprise, uh, the enterprise integration capabilities, uh, XML mapping, you have JSON mapping, you can do uh, object manipulation uh, within logic apps, content-based router, Right, so you can look at the content you know, as the message comes in. We can make it really easy for you either to do an X path to a particular field in your XML message, or with JSON, you can use the first class set of tokens to then uh, base that on a switch statement or some other criteria, or push it to a, a topic and then let the topic do the work for you uh, for content-based routing. And then you know, when you put all these things together, then you can do message pipelining. Right, So the, the typical scenarios as a vetter, so validate. Uh, uh, enrich, extract, transform, enrich, and then route. Right, so all this is capable within logic apps. 
So as you do queuing, uh, you want to be able to you want to be able to do uh, scenarios where you want to have safe extraction of your messages from the queue. Uh, so you don't want to pull the message from the queue and, and delete it right away because then something may happen downstream, fail, and now that message is lost. Uh, so you can implement the peak lock pattern in, in logic apps so that, uh, for example, you have a service bus queue or topic. Then you can, uh, when that message arrives, we have a, a, a peak lock pattern. Then you can handle the message, and if something, uh, if everything goes well, you complete it. If something goes wrong, you can either abandon it or put into a, a dead letter queue. Um, if you do long processing before you commit to uh, completing the message or handling the message, you can extend um, the the timeout on messages. There's a default timeout in Service Bus. Uh, I forget what the default timeout is a few minutes, but you can go ahead, if you know that's, that's, long, that's going to be a long process, you can go ahead and extend that lock and then keep that message alive so it doesn't get auto-abandoned for you. Let's do a peak lock. And I'm going to put that in my handy dandy resource group. And I'll pin that to the dashboard. Okay. So while this logic app is being created, so what I'm going to do is, is show you how you can do your, your peak lock uh, in logic apps using queues. Oh, I should pull out. I get to use IoT. It's like, what? What does IoT have to do with messaging? Everything. I see buttons. OK. Now everybody's curious. What am I going to do with that button? So the first thing we want to do is, is uh, go ahead and uh, open service bus. So we're going to do a one-way, some one-way messaging. And in this case, I'm going to want a message received in a queue peak lock. Right? So I'm going to listen for, for a message in the queue and peek at that message. And then essentially, it locks it so nobody else can get to it. Uh, and they, I'll go ahead and do my request queue. We talked about uh, you don't do need to do any impressions in 30 seconds. OK, so then the, what I want to do is I want to do some actions. I don't know what I'm going to do yet, so I'll just put a scope. It's like there's my actions. And then finally, I'm going to complete the message. And complete the message in a queue, where we pick our queue, which is our request queue. And then finally, the lock. I just want to pause here for a second. So I just did uh, you know, a peak lock scenario in Logic Apps in about 10 seconds. How long would that take me to write in code? Uh, OK. Um, so so I, I've, you know, what, what we see here is the ability to go ahead and uh, peek into, into the queue do some magic work, and I'll, and I'll do something interesting in a second, and then complete that message. So the simplest scenario that you can think of. But sometimes that stuff that you do fails or has an error. So uh, you know, we talked about that try, catch, finally scenario. So what I'm going to do here is add a parallel step. I'm going to add an action. And again, this time in Service Bus, if something bad happens, I want to dead letter it. Right? There, are a couple, there are many different things you can do, but I'll keep this simple which is uh, dead letter the message in a queue. OK, so I'm going to pick my, my request queue and the lock token for that. But now what I want to do is like, well, I don't want to do both of these. I've got to choose one. So we go here to this. Let me do this for you guys. Hey, look at that. That's bigger. Can you guys see in the back? All right. So I'm going to go ahead and configure the uh, run after. And so typically, we, we mark is successful for you. But this time, instead of doing that, I want to do, if anything else happens besides being successful, please dead, dead letter this message. Done. OK, and then what you'll see is this red dot, 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 so that you know that it's, a, uh, it's under some different criteria that will run. So this is my my pattern for being able to do uh, you know, peak lock and being able to dead letter in case something goes wrong. Save that. Everything works. Everybody's happy. Great. But let's do something interesting. 
Uh, I want to show you the parallelism within logic apps. Oh, I got three minutes, okay. Uh, parallelism, so let's go ahead and send approval. So what I'm gonna do is, is for every message that comes in, this is not necessarily a realistic scenario, but I wanted to prove a point about how parallelism works in, in logic apps. So I'm gonna send this to myself. And I will send the content of the body to me in email. And I'm gonna add a condition that says, if the selected option is approve, Oh, that's not what I want to do. Zoom in is really hard. Okay. There we go. I want to, if, if I've approved it, then I want to send it to the uh, approval queue. So I'm going to head call service bus again. Maybe I've zoomed in too much. Well, let's see. We love Zoom. Let's zoom out a little bit. Sorry, guys. There we go. Okay, so I'm going to send this message to uh, an approval queue. And uh, the content will be the content of the original message that came in. And the, uh, that's it. Right, I'm just gonna send that content to, to that queue. And if it doesn't work, right, if I reject it, then I want to send that message to a rejected queue. And send to rejected queue and then the content is my content. That's it. Easy. Okay, let's go ahead and save that. So as a matter of fact, let's make this, here's a little, little tidbit for you. If you don't like these names, change them. Send to rejected queue. Okay. Go ahead and save that. So now, uh, what I'm gonna do is I have Everything's working correctly. I have already built a logic app that will act as my, where, where's my logic app? Oh, I see I'm on the wrong dashboard. Come on. Yeah, that's okay. So I'm not gonna go waste time on that. So I have a logic app that will actually listen to this button and every time I click the button, it's going to send a message to my request queue. Huh? So we can do IoT devices calling a, a logic app to go do that. So let's go and see. I have a service bus queue here, and I'm gonna send two messages. Okay, I click my button twice, and if I refresh fast enough, we should see two messages in the request queue. Magic. Okay, and then uh, if I go back to my logic app, what I'll see, I should see, is two instances running, right? So we talked about the parallelism of those logic apps. It's sitting there waiting for me to approve uh, these, these messages. And I would have in my email, once this comes up, see it's waiting there, waiting for that approval message. So if I go to my email, we'll see that there are two approvals sitting in my inbox. I can go ahead and I'll approve this one and reject this one. And then we can see going back here that this one is completed. It's, it's, uh, it went through the successful path. And then this one, if I did it right, oh, I didn't show you actually. Condition, this one went through the reject queue and this one went through the approved queue. Great. Parallelism. So let's go ahead and change it. I'm gonna go a little faster. Uh, I'm gonna change this so that uh, I'm gonna change my levels of parallelization on this. So if I go to, to settings, there's this great concurrency control. So if I turn that on, so you can see that you can go from right 50 down to one. So I want this to be a singleton. So I'm gonna change that to one. Done, save. I go back to my handy dandy service bus helper. 
Right, you see one in each of those queues. And I'm going to do this twice again. A few more messages have gone through. But this time, what you'll see, right, there's two messages there, is that when I go back to my logic app, I will, everything's gone right, have only one pending, uh, come on, one, one pending item that's waiting for me. And so if I go to my email, this comes up. See, it's, it's, it's pending. So if I bring this up, I'll see this, this last approval. And once I approve it, this will go through. This will complete. And then we'll see a second instance come up. A second instance come up. Come on. Anticipation. I know it's there. Hello? You believe me? Yes, I know you guys believe me. It's there. Come on, there it is. Then there's a second one. So this is you know, showing that you can do in-order processing or making sure that you handle only one message at a time. So now this is a new message. Now it's sitting in my inbox. Uh, and if I let this sit here for a while, I'll actually time out. And we'll go back into the queue. And then we'll fail as if I try to complete this message, uh, because that's how timeouts work on messages. So that's it. I'm going to reject that one. So what I've shown you is the ability to do uh, tries and, and uh, your, your try scope. And then if something fails, to go ahead and dead letter a message in the queue and do parallelism within logic apps. So in order processing. So if you want to use uh, do in order processing, keep in mind that you have to use a transport that supports in order processing. Service bus is a great uh, transport for that. Um, use singleton workflows. So the workflow has to be in the singleton mode because we instinctively uh, run in parallel. Uh, remove parallelism for for each. So if you have a for each statement in your in your logic app and you and you want uh, the sequential pattern, make sure that you turn that off and. Uh, um, Derek will show you that as well. And we can also do sequential convoys. So sequential convoys would be, imp would be uh, done in logic apps using service bus sessions. So those sessions, everybody know what a sequential convoy is? You old biz talk guys, right? Yeah, some of you guys, the old, old guys know. So sequential convoy is the ability to have a convoy, right, a series of convoys of messages that go in order to uh, your destination. So for example, I use that hospital scenario. So Bob goes to the hospital and he has 10 messages about getting checked in, getting his, uh, his blood taken, getting a bed, et cetera. But all those messages happen and get mixed up uh, in a queue. If you use sessions and you listen to that session called Bob, you will only get Bob's messages and they will be in order in that session. So you can, you can enable that in logic apps as well. So that's it. I want to give Derek his opportunity to do best practices. All right. All right. So let's switch gear a little bit and talk about best practices uh, when you work on your logic app. Now, these are brand new content uh, that were prepared specifically for you, and they have never been shown before. So hopefully, you will like it. Let's start with variables. Variables are quite helpful and useful in Logic App, but there are a few things you should keep in mind when using them. First is that variables in Logic Apps, they are all global variables, meaning they have to be declared, initialized at the root level. They cannot happen in a scope, in a condition. There are reasons for it, and there are workarounds uh, that you can do uh, to, to work around the limitation, and we'll get into it very shortly. The second is array is heterogeneous, meaning if you have an array variable, you can have different types of objects in the array. We do not enforce a schema, nor do we do validation when you append to the array. So you can technically have an array with some integers, with some Boolean values, with some nested arrays. Um, it's up to you to determine if that's the best course of action for your scenario, but we do not block you from doing that thing. Lastly, care needs to be taken when you use a, uh, when you use variables within the for each loop. Like Kevin have mentioned, for each loop by default runs in parallel. We run up to 20 instances by default for for each loop, and it can be configured from anywhere between 1 to 50. Uh, so. Uh, Something that you do may not give you the expected results. Um, 
Referencing a variable is perfectly fine. If you want to increment and decrement a variable, that's perfectly fine to do in a default for each loop that runs in parallel. Setting a variable most likely will not work and will not give you the expected results. And uh, appending to arrays, depending on what you are expecting, it may or may not work. So what do I mean by that? Let's switch to the demo really quick. So here I have a logic app where I simply initialize an array variable. I don't have an initial content. And in a for each loop, I'm using this range expression to loop it over for 10 times. I'm going to just add an action called append to array. So I'm going to append the current item to this array variable. I'm just going to select my array variable here, and I'm going to choose the current item as the value that I'm appending to it. After the for each, I'm just going to use a compose to print out the value so we can examine it in the run history view. So I'm going to select compose, and I'm going to choose the variable as the input. So let's save that and see what happened. Normally, you would expect the array that you get from running this particular logic app to start from zero and goes all the way up to nine. Would that be the case? We'll take a few seconds to run the for each loop. So if we open the compose card, you will see the numbers are actually inserted out of order. Again, if you think about how logic app executes your parallels and how it executes your for each loops, it makes sense because we run all 10 iterations at the same time, and any particular iteration may complete, resulting in the value to be inserted at a random order. So how do we fix that? What if you do want this array to be in a ascending order? Let's switch back to designer. We'll go into the settings page for this for each action. We'll turn on concurrency control. You will see by default it's set to 20 like we previously mentioned. I'm just going to put the slider all the way down to 1, meaning I want to run this for each loop in a sequential fashion. So I'm going to save the logic app and just run this. I didn't change anything except how I want the for each loop to execute. So now, once this run is complete and we can examine the compose output, if everything goes as planned, we should see these values showing in an ascending order. So something you have to consider when building your logic app and when consuming variables and when working with for each loops. Uh, sequential for each comes in handy when you want this in order. Um, behavior. Since we're talking about arrays, um, I thought we would just expand this a little bit more. So working with arrays, logic can make it quite easy for you to work with arrays. We give you tokens, we add ex uh, implicit for each for you when reference a particular object or property within that array. Um, well, let's, let, let's pick a particular example. So we have been using orders uh, for Contos Retail. Let's say we receive a batch order of 10,000 items, and so we want to do some business logic on top of this particular um, array. Um, We'll say, let's say, if the order is greater than $10,000, we want to access some business logic, we want to send some approval, but about 10% of those orders will meet this criteria. So out of the 10,000, we'll probably have a 1,000 of those orders in which we want to run this approval. How do you do it? Normally, so let me switch back to another logic app in which I already have the schema prepared. Normally, you would start with a for each loop. You would say, for my for each loop, I'm going to loop over the array, in which case is the body of my request. Inside for each, I'm going to use a condition. I'm going to say uh, the amount, uh, which is the one that I care about, is greater than 1,000. Right, so if that is the criteria, it matches the criteria. If it's true, I'm going to do something. I'm just going to use compose as an example. So this is our do something action. This is what most people do. But if you think about it, is there another way that we can make this better, both for performance and for cost? Instead of doing a for each and then a condition, we can actually tweak this just a little bit. I'm going to use a filter array instead. 
filter array is a single action that takes an array as input and allow me to get a new array based on the filtering criteria that I'm looking for. So in this case, I'm saying I want to filter the body array which is coming from the trigger. I'm gonna filter it down to only those that has an order amount greater than a thousand. Once I have the filtered array, then I can use a for each loop and I can loop over the new array and do my business logic on top of it. So what's the difference? Well, let's compare. The first operation, we would incur one billable event for the for each action, but the condition will actually execute 10,000 times because we have an array of size 10,000 that we loop over. Only 10% of those will meet the condition criteria that we defined, so we'll actually execute the compose in which we use to demonstrate the business logic a thousand times, which results in a total of 11,000 and one billable action. The second option though, we incur one billable event for the filter array, we do one billable event for the for each, but we only have to do a thousand action and which in total is only a thousand and two. So that's 10x difference. We tweak the logic up just a little bit and we lower the cost 10 times full. So this is, this is quite cool, I think. And it's something that you should consider depending on scenario, depending on the array, the kind of things, that, the kind of data that you're working with, there are ways that you can optimize to, um, to save cost. But is there another way? Instead of doing the for each here, the other option is to call a child logic app. So instead of doing the for each, I'm gonna call into a child logic app. I think we call it a child logic demo. So here we are gonna pass in the filtered array as the input. So what are we doing here? Instead of looping over the array, we're actually passing down the filtered array to a child logic app. And in the child logic app, if I switch to that, we can then put a split on, on the trigger. So we'll say we want to split on the input array and execute my business logic. So let me switch back to the deck and let's take a look at the comparison. So the third option is actually a little bit more expensive. Right? If, you look, if you do the math, we'll do one for filter array, one for for each, one to call the child logic app. The split on trigger will incur additional 1,001 billable actions and everything else remains the same. So it's twice as expensive as the second option, but there are some distinct advantage to it. We talked about variables being global scope within logic app, but by putting the, uh, by, by, but by calling the child logic app, I can actually have a variable in my child logic app that is localized to the current item that I'm processing. So this is the workaround that I mentioned. If I want to have a local variable for the current iteration, this is how I can do that. The other thing that I want to mention is there is actually a performance difference between the two options. If you think about it, what do we do for four each? We actually run multiple iterations in parallel. We do 20 by default and you can increase it to 50, but still there is a limit. If I have a thousand items, I can do only 50 at a time. Then we have to wait for all the iterations to complete, and then we aggregate the results so we know what is the terminal status from it for each action, and then any action after that can be executed depending on their run after status. So that's the overhead I incur by doing for each. When calling a child logic app, there's really no upper limit on how many child logic app that I can spin up with a split on trigger. So when I pass in an array of a thousand items, I can actually create a thousand child logic app running instance all happening at the same time. The parent logic app is also fire and forget. The logic app will simply have to call the child logic app, pass in the array, and be done with it. We don't have to wait for it to complete. 
which means there's no aggregation of the data from all the instance, and which makes the parent logic app also runs faster. So again, it's always a trade-off, is how much do you want to spend, and what is the performance target that you are aiming at. So uh, we talk about cost estimation, and we have been looking at those tables. If you remember about a year ago, this is kind of the form that you have to do to figure out how much your logic app will cost you. It's really complicated. We have made it much simpler. Uh, it's really three bullet points that I think about when estimating cost. Trigger evaluation costs money, and action execution costs money. Retry counts as well. We only charge if the status is succeeded or failed. That means number of action that I see in the designer doesn't necessarily equal to the action that I will be built when I trigger a run. Think about it, if I have a condition and I have two action in each of the branch, only one branch will execute for any particular run. That means I will only be built for two actions instead of four. So these are the things that you should take into consideration. Similarly, run afters, right? If we have something that ran after failure and we didn't, ex uh, we didn't run into an error scenario, I'm not gonna be charged for those actions because they will be skipped. Then we have three different tiers of actions. We have built-in, we have connectors, and then we have enterprise connectors. They are priced differently. Now the question that we hear from many people is, how can I figure out how much a particular action will cost, and how can I tell whether it's a built-in action or whether it's a connector or enterprise connector? We have listened to your feedback, and we, we are working on a UI refreshment. You have seen a sneak peek from Kevin's demo previously. So this is the new search experience that we're working on and will be available very soon. The change we're making here is we're breaking up different types of actions into a few buckets or pivots. So we still have the all view for you to browse and see the 200 plus different connectors that Logic Apps give you in one unified view. But then you can also browse only the connectors, enterprise connectors, built-in, or even your custom connector one. So we're making this very easy for you to find the things you're looking for and know where they belong. And this is also a good starting point. It's a good canvas for us to start adding more stuff to it. You have been asking us to be more smart in helping you build integration solutions, making smart recommendations on what actions to use next, give me the things that I just use, allow me to favorite things that I want to see all the time. This is the place that we can enable those scenarios for you. So I think that's the demo, and I hope you like it. And uh, like I said, uh, and like we have mentioned previously, if you have any feedback in the design, if there's anything that you want to see, go to our user voice page, go to our Twitter, and uh, let us know what you think and what you want us to be working on next. Thank you very much.